Namaste, and welcome to the final episode of Book One of Yoga Vasishta. And you know, the name of Book One is the Vairagya Khanda. Khanda means like a chapter or a section. So, translated into English, it becomes the Vairagya chapter or book. But what does Vairagya mean, actually? A lot of times it's translated renunciation. And that has the connotation of making a rule about giving something up. So, actually, <laughs> that is a very kind of a crude concept, which does not really address the psychological reality of giving things up. Well, why do we give things up? Or even more generally, why do we make rules? Rules are so we don't have to think, we don't have to feel, we don't have to address the actual issue. But it just becomes a reactive uh, way of dealing with things. Like uh, uh, chocolate? No, I don't, I don't eat sweets. It's a rule. So, of course, the problem is we can't always follow our rules because things change. The material world is under constant transformation. So, if we make a rule, there's no guarantee we're going to be able to follow it or that it would be good to follow it in the future. And then, if we break our word, then on top of the whole, whatever other problems come out of it, we have a problem with our integrity. So it's better not to make a promise to give up something. Rather, let's look into the actual definition of vairagya in the Sanskrit dictionary. I'm looking at it now. Vairagya means aversion, dislike, disinclination, asceticism, apathy, freedom from all worldly desires, distaste for or loathing of, disgust, indifference to worldly objects and to life, change or loss of color, growing pale, or aversion. Aversion is really the main definition. So it's not about making rules. It's about developing an aversion to the things that keep us trapped, uh, to the various forms of sense enjoyment, egotism, desire, and ignorance that keep us in this material world. That's why in this whole chapter or book on Vairagya, Vairagya Khanda, you have not heard the words give up even once. I just did a search, <laughs> confirmed it. There's no mention of making rules. Don't do this, don't do that. Huh? That's not mentioned at all. So what is Rama's monologue really about? If you read it carefully, you'll find it's actually about distaste. That I don't like this material world because everything you do has some downside. Everything you try to enjoy or possess leads to suffering. So when we see the material world with that kind of intelligence, we automatically develop distaste, aversion. Uh -huh. Like if you ever smoked cigarettes uh, and it made you sick, <laughs> then anytime somebody offers you a cigarette, it's like, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. Not because you made a rule about it, but because you know it's going to make you sick. If you know something's going to give you suffering, then why should you accept it? Now, this world is constantly 
trying to seduce us with different offerings of sense pleasures. Oh, look at this. Isn't this beautiful? Huh? Uh, or the, like the commercials on TV. New. <laughs> the best. More. <laughs> Better. Huh? Always hitting on these psychological buttons. I used to work in advertising right out of college. And I know how they construct these ads. They use a lot of psychology. In fact, one time, this is a great story. This is what, when I quit. Huh? They had brought at tremendous expense this big, big psychiatrist from Germany to help them understand how to make their uh, advertising program better. They were advertising tires, uh, Armstrong tires. And so the guy was saying, you guys are doing it all wrong. You are aiming your advertising campaigns at three to five year olds mentality. But our tests and studies have shown that tire buying loyalty can be created as early as 18 months. So that means you have to address your uh, ad campaigns to a more infantile mentality. Those were the exact words he used. The infantile mentality. <laughs> Guy was a real case. So at that point I said, oh, this is ridiculous. I'm out of here. I already had enough money to live for years. <laughs> so I quit over ethics because why? It had become distasteful. It's distasteful that we are trying to put together an ad campaign to influence babies to buy tires when they grow up. That to me was just too absurd, too ridiculous. huh? Once I was an insider at the company and I found out how the ads were actually made, it was like, ew, yuck. I can't do this. I can't participate in this. This is ugly. It's manipulative. It's exploitative. I don't want any part of it. So, you know, you're talking to me as somebody who gave up meat at age 16 because I couldn't stand the idea of killing animals. Actually, it made me sick. Huh? Like, ew, this was part of a chicken, you know. Uh, you know what chickens eat? Ugh. I don't want any part of it. I used to throw my meat under the table to the dog. <laughs> so, if you really understand what is involved in these different topics, we went over the topics yesterday that Rama uh, mentioned in his talk. If you really understand the way this material world works, huh, you're going to develop a distaste for it. Like, oh, this is just a meat grinder. People come into this world and then they're exploited by all these outside interests against their real benefit. And then they die. And because they have all these wrong ideas, wrong views, desires, and so on, they have to take birth again and again and again and again until they develop vairagya. Once a person has vairagya, detachment, distaste, aversion, to the material world. Then, even when they have to leave the body at death, they are not going to begin to fashion another body to satisfy their desires. Why? They won't have any desires. They will have given up their desires. And really, it doesn't take much experience in this world to see how desires ruin everything for us and for everyone. That everyone is going around trying to satisfy these desires. And yet, do we ever really succeed? Well, maybe for a few minutes. 
<laughs> and then again, they start up. You see, there is a whole philosophy that becoming desireless requires us to satisfy all our cravings. Uh, this is uh, actually the philosophy of the demons. Uh, and it was taught in the Vedas by Shukracharya. Shukra, of course, is Venus. And Venus, of course, is known as the planet of love, right? But really, it's the planet of lust. <laughs> if you do any amount of astrology, <laughs> it's very easy to see. So Shukracharya told the demons, they were asking him, how can we become spiritually aware? Every time we try to meditate, our minds are simply disturbed with desires. And so he says, oh, very easy. You just have to get enough sense satisfaction, enough sense gratification, enough enjoyment, then the desire will leave you. And being demons, of course, they bought right into it. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and there are even so-called spiritual masters on this planet teaching the same thing. But actually, this approach to extinguishing desire is like trying to extinguish a fire by throwing gasoline on it. Did you ever do that? I did when I was a stupid kid. <laughs> threw gasoline on a fire, and for about a second, it goes down. And then, whoom, big flame comes out. And if you're lucky, you're not too close. <laughs> I lost my eyebrows one time that way. <laughs> so, actual relief from desire does not come from satisfying them. It comes from seeing through them. Like one of the things mentioned in the talk of the celestial uh, spiritual masters yesterday was that Rama's talk was perspicacious. Perspicacious means to see through. Per means through. And spica means to see, as in spectacles. Uh, spec. So... Perspicacious means seeing through everything. And certainly Rama's speech brought out the downside of everything that we consider normally to be attractive and wonderful. Huh? Well, it's only wonderful until you get the bill. <laughs> then it's like, wow, this is expensive. This is too much. Because every time we make something ours in order to bolster our ego, then there's some karma to pay. And if we try to enjoy it, that it just increases the karma. So because of this, then we have to take birth again. And the way it works is that because one has cultivated a desire for this thing, whatever it is, then when that thing is taken away, either at death or beforehand, then we want to build another body, another existence, another birth, so that we can enjoy the results of our desire. And since the results of desire are never perfect, this is a never-ending game. It's called samsara, rebirth, or suffering in material existence. So real vairagya means seeing through the game of enjoyment, possession, ego, and desire. And because of that, losing the desire, losing the lust or hatred, which is the opposite of lust. I want this, I don't want that. It's the same thing, just two sides of the same coin. And understanding that the more I try to bolster my ego and make it strong and powerful, the bigger the price I'm going to have to pay in the future. And seeing that, one develops distaste. Like, oh, I don't want to do that. 
I really don't want to do that. So we become averse to material acquisition, possession, and enjoyment. And this is the real vairagya. Huh? Not any artificial rules or structures of belief about what is good and bad. No. We see that in this material world, basically, everything is bad. So we lose interest in the game. And we want to play a better game. The game of moksha, liberation, release from material existence. So in the next book, book two, Vasishta begins his answer to Rama's questions. And what is he talking about? Mumukshu, the aspirant for liberation. What is the qualities? What is the uh, being? And what are the methods that lead to moksha? So the second book is called Mumukshu Kanda. Om Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yida